Uh, thank you, Chairman Grassley. And again, I want to echo the uh, comments of my colleagues about how grateful I am that you're honoring uh, the, the allowing individual senators to have their say. It means a lot to me that you would conduct yourself in this hearing in that manner. So thank you very much. Um, it's just good to be here. It's good to sit amongst uh, uh, colleagues that I respect on both sides of the aisle. Uh, I've really appreciated how this committee has conducted itself when I was not on it uh, and the thoroughness in which uh, folks have been looking at the vacancies to be filled. Um, it's precisely why we take this process so seriously because there is such a significant impact on our nation, not just in the present day, uh, but indeed in generations to come. Uh, I've evaluated all the nominees before this committee today, uh, and I'm proud to say that there are candidates who I look forward to supporting. Uh, I've tried to take the import, input of my colleagues on both sides of the aisle. In fact, just yesterday, when Senator Moran came to me uh, to give me more input on a, a, a judge that he had nominated, it actually changed my mind and made me uh, want to support his candidate based upon the evidence he presented to me. I have serious uh, questions, though, about the qualifications of several nominees, all of which I will not discuss uh, now. I'm concerned about their commitment to upholding equal justice under the law, uh, a principle that is sacrosanct in our nation. Uh, I'd like to begin, though, and focus most of my uh, discussion on perhaps uh, someone who is uh, the most objectionable ju judicial nominee we've seen uh, in this past year. Uh, several of my colleagues have already discussed uh, and raised questions about the nominee for the Eastern District of North Carolina, Thomas Farr. When he appeared before this committee last year, uh, uh, and I've provided several questions uh, to him uh, since that in writing uh, to what he has responded. Uh, the reason he has faced so many questions and the reason several of my esteemed colleagues uh, from the CBC are here, and I want to thank them uh, for their presence, uh, folks who represent people uh, in North Carolina, um, the reason why so much concern is that he has spent much of his legal career actively undermining civil rights protections and the voting rights of people, uh, of Americans of color. Uh, there are a lot of facts that have been thrown out and I feel like that there, the water has been muddied considerably. Uh, and I'd like to state very plainly for the record uh, some of the facts that I've been focusing on uh, over these past days. Time and time again, Mr. Farr in his legal career has worked to weaken the civil rights protections uh, for workers and everyday Americans on behalf of powerful interests. Uh, the cases Mr. Farr has chosen to take on over his decade-long career reflect the very methodical, repeated efforts to weaken critical civil rights protections, erode anti-discrimination protections, suppress the voter, vote, vote in communities of color, and attack workers' rights to organize. In a report on Mr. Farr's nomination, the Alliance for Justice wrote, and I quote, that it would be difficult to identify an attorney in North Carolina whose career is more closely associated with attacks on the rights of vulnerable citizens. In fact, he's gone out of his way to advance this agenda. In one instance, as a private attorney in North Carolina, he filed an amicus brief in a suit that challenged a California labor law that established the right of state employees to organize. Mr. Farr also represented uh, the state of North Carolina in a federal appeals court and lost one of the biggest cases defending the state's notorious and discriminatory voter ID law. Uh, and as people have already discussed, uh, that was one that was seen to target African Americans with almost surgical precision. Now I bring up Farr's record uh, before the committee today, not under the illusion, I think as okay. Senator Cornyn. Uh, uh, Can we uh, have uh, quorum? I mean, uh, attention to what Senator Booker is saying. Go ahead, Senator Booker. Thank you very much, Senator Grassley. <clears throat> I wanted to give deference to Senator Corrin's very apt question uh, about the question that should lawyers be held responsible for their clients' actions. Uh, I think that's fundamentally uh, correct, uh, that, that responsibility um, is not, uh, the, the representation does not necessarily mean uh, that one represents those views. Clearly, our nation in its very founding uh, knows that. We know the examples of our founding fathers. Alexander Hamilton was pilloried for representing uh, uh, British loyalists after the Revolutionary War, and we all know the story of the Boston Massacre, and John Adams representing people that fired upon Americans, killing amongst them the first person to die for our country, an African American named Crispus Attucks. Clearly, they did not share the views uh, of those people, and I appreciate that, that sentiment. Uh, but Mr. Farr is responsible for painstakingly throughout his career going out of his way 
to create a pattern of taking on such cases. Unlike our founding fathers, the very pillar and center of their legal career was not representing British interest, it was representing American interest. Mr. Farr, on the other hand, uh, has also again and again taken on these specific kind of cases to weaken the protections uh, of civil, weaken the protections of our civil rights. It is also during Mr. Farr's time in private practice that he served as a legal counsel to the re-election campaign of then Senator Jesse Helms of North Carolina. It was while Mr. Farr served as campaign counsel that the Helms campaign notoriously and egregiously uh, sent out over 120,000 postcards uh, to black citizens of North Carolina, to voters in North Carolina, suggesting that they were not in only ineligible to vote, but threatened them with criminal prosecution if they did. This, was, this is not just discriminatory. Uh, this is not just anti-democratic, but it is ugly, and it is a part of our ugly history of an attempt to suppress the votes of, of Americans simply because of their color. This is an unlawful act. And in fact, this act was so grievous that the U.S. Justice Department under George H.W. Bush uh, um, ultimately filed a complaint in federal court against the Helms for Senate campaign and the North Carolina Republican Party as a whole. Now, Mr. Farr denied involvement in this scheme, uh, but discrepancies now have come to light between his testimony to the Judiciary Committee and the historical record and this raises serious questions that remain unanswered and have brought to light many contradictions that cast a serious doubt and shadow uh, over his own account. For instance, ranking member Feinstein asked in a question for the record in this hearing, in a hearing in this committee, uh, she asked, and I quote her, do you have any role in drafting or sending of the postcards? Did you participate in any meetings in which the postcards were discussed before they were sent. If so, please explain your role. Mr. Farr simply and directly replied <clears throat> no to that question. However, press reports and the account of Gerald Herbert, a former Department of Justice attorney, tell a different story. Now, Gerald Herbert's uh, uh, integrity has been questioned uh, because in 1986, he came before this committee and gave testimony that was not accurate. But after that testimony, he himself discovered his mistake, and without any prompting from anyone, he reported himself that mistake, corrected the record, wasn't forced to, but found it before anybody else. That is the mark, actually, of an honorable man that you would do that. A report from November 2017 from a North Carolina publication read, a former Department of Justice prosecutor repeated to Indy this week what he told this reporter in 2009 that Farr knew about the postcards well in advance of the mailing, which implies that he misled the Senate committee about his involvement. In fact, that same reporter wrote back in 2009 and stated, I quote, Farr said on Monday that he had limited contact with campaign officials before the 1990 mailing and advised them, advised them not to send the postcards. It does not make sense that Farr now claims that he did not know about the postcards prior to their mailing when he stated in 2009 that he advised the campaign not to send them. That just doesn't measure up. I don't care how many times you look at it, it just doesn't measure up and implicates the testimony that he gave before this committee. Based on this, I sent a letter to Mr. Farr to clarify why he responded no to the ranking member of this committee, Diane Feinstein, no to her question regarding whether he participated in any meetings in which the postcards were discussed before they were sent. Mr. Farr's response raised even more complications and contradictions to his testimony. In a response to one of the questions I posed on this very serious discrepancy, he stated, and I quote, several weeks before the election, I participated in a short meeting with persons who wanted to be hired to do a ballot security program for the Helms Committee in 1990. Well, that security program was, the post, was inclusive of the postcards that were being sent out. This again contradicts his response to ranking member Feinstein's question. The postcards were part of that ballot security question. Mr. Farr's hearing before this committee occurred before Senator Harris and I joined. And we have not had the opportunity to ask Mr. Farr in person uh, and to go through this testimony on these very troubling questions. 
it, it is, we have factual implications that cast a shadow over the truthfulness of a person for a lifetime appointment to the federal bench. We have not had a chance to question him about what it seems to be misleading testimony given to one of the more esteemed members, not just of this committee, but of the United States Senate. Not only does his letter seem to contradict the testimony that he gave, but two other sources, a reporter and a former member of the Justice Department, also contradict his testimony before this committee. It doesn't seem a lot to ask that before we give such a person a lifetime appointment to the bench, that this committee take one small step and ask him to come back before us and allow Senator Feinstein and other new members of this committee to ask him about these contradictions. If he has nothing to worry about, if there's nothing to hide, why not have a chance to set the record straight <laughs> before one of the most important committees uh, in the United States of America? It is clear to me that Mr. Farr's involvement in Mr. Helms' campaign, the extent of which I believe deserves further scrutiny, is one part of a larger career, which is much, much of which has been spent to undermining civil rights, voting rights, and workers' rights. The Eastern District of North Carolina is where close to half of the entire black population of North Carolina resides, some of whom perhaps almost 20 years ago received a note in the mail from Mr. Farr's boss that used Jim Crow era tactics, scare tactics, to suppress African American votes. In fact, some of the very citizens who were intimidated through these voter suppression tactics of the Helms campaign will be presumably and potentially going before Mr. Farr if he becomes a judge. With those citizens, with those African Americans walking into that courtroom with knowledge that this committee didn't fully vet this issue, would those citizens really believe that they would receive impartial, that this would receive an impartial forum for the just resolution of disputes, which is the defined mission of the Eastern District of North Carolina? Since this nomination, even before I joined this Judiciary Committee, my office alone has heard impassioned pleas, not from far left organizations, not from people on the, merger, uh, on the margins of our political debates, but I've, I've received impassioned pleas from civic activists. I've received impassioned pleas from clergy. I've impassioned pleas from community leaders throughout North Carolina. I've received impassioned pleas from advocates pleading with us to prevent this nominee from being confirmed. Sir, I have not been on this committee to know how often members of the Congressional Black Caucus come to a meeting. And I know there's been lots of judges that have caused concerns. But the presence of these esteemed members of the Congressional Black Caucus here today, that they would take time out of their very busy schedule at, 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 in the midst of a potential government shutdown, when there's serious work to do there, these incredible members, one of whom behind me represents uh, people in this community, shows <laughs> the importance that this holds. I didn't think so. And I myself uh, have a deep family history in North Carolina. My father, I don't know if you're aware of this, was born and raised in that state, sir. That state has done so much for my family. I have family members, cousins, uncles, who live in this community that will be affected by our decision here. These folks are not all that political. Uh, their folks are not going to marches or rallies. They're regular folk. Uh, and they, too, bear real concerns about this nominee. I believe right now that Mr. Farr's career choices clearly show a pattern of what are the pillars of his career, about what his opinions are about civil rights and workers' rights and voting rights. I believe that he is unqualified to sustain equal justice under the law, unqualified to provide impartiality, an impartial forum for just resolution, unqualified to uphold the integrity that our judicial system demands, and I believe that he's unqualified to do something that I always believe that the judiciary should do. It should restore and undermine, it should restore and underline uh, the people's faith uh, in the judiciary, in the judicial process. That faith is the bedrock uh, of our country. More than the documents, the founding documents, it's the faith that the people put in those documents and ideals that, that's what counts. 
And this will be more than any other judge we're considering today, a blow to so many people in that state and their faith in the impartiality of our judicial process. Given these facts, I, I again request to you, Mr. Chairman, given the facts and the discrepancies and the contradictions uh, in his testimony, in the letter he spent in response to my questions, in the reports, open reports in the press, I again humbly request to you that we hold this nomination for another hearing to allow Chair, Chair, uh, Ranking Member Feinstein uh, to again ask her questions and to allow new members of this committee uh, to go through the record uh, and to straighten out these, these contradictions before we put somebody on the bench uh, that has this shadow hanging over them. There are others, and I'm going to submit some other concerns I have for the record. I, I've taken up enough of your time, and I don't want to overindulge uh, your grace in the way you're conducting this hearing. Uh, but clearly with um, other judges that have been mentioned, Mr. Clark, Mr. Uh, Dryband, I, I have concerns about uh, LGDB, LGBTQ con uh, concerns. I have concerns about transgender rights. I have concerns about the civil rights of other judges. Uh, but I do want to highlight, uh, again, my request uh, that was given to you in writing uh, in this open committee uh, because of the concerns that are expressed here by others today, by myself, the presence of uh, leaders uh, in Congress, uh, and I hope and I, uh, that you might uh, again entertain my request, Mr. Chairman. 